Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is take two of the Friday Tomcast for January 28th, 2022. We got coffee. We got a mic that actually is on this time. I turned this off by accident. out of my way. I'm not thinking about it. And we're drawing a little fan art of a YouTuber named Hop. He does videos for the Firearms blog. And I think, let me get his actual video channel for you all out there. I think it's Hop Lop and Heel or something. Hop Lop and Heil. Hop Lop and Lop and Hop Lop for Heil. Let me show you what this is. But I like his videos. They're funny. It's got a real dry sense of humor, but it's great. Hop Lop for Heil. I don't know how he pronounces that. Luke C., if you watch this video, let me know how you pronounce that. So, we're going to draw, this is my brainstorming process. I want to do a really silly drawing of Hop. Instead of shooting a rifle, he's been shrunk somehow in the Alice of Wonderland, Pacific Northwest woods, and he has to defend himself against the Queen's Guard. And the only thing that his little shrunken body can handle is a Taurus G3. So we're doing a couple things. We're doing a portrait of a pistol, along with a portrait of of a person. So by sharing today, it motivates me to draw a little bit, try to entertain all of you out there who tune into this, want to hang out, want to comment, show you some of my process for working out what I want to draw. One of the challenges of being somebody who thinks while creating creative work is overthinking the thing. And in that, if I overthink this idea too much, I realize if Hop pulls the trigger on a giant handgun, this slide is going to go back and dislocate his shoulder or maybe his torso. Because if he's been shrunken down to about four inches tall, maybe six inches tall, or like a 12 inch GI Joe, uh, that's going to be a lot of force. It's going to be a lot of G forces coming off the back of this pistol <laughs> i just think this is a funny idea i would like an action figure of hop that is cradling a giant or actually a standard size gun but it's giant compared to this little uh this little body he's got it'll be fun just want to get some of the some of the ideas worked out so drawing cylinders to Express where the arms would be. If you're just starting out and learning how to draw, I think tracing is fine. If you just want to explore style and color, you can trace the line work. But I'm trying to practice how to draw something from, from seeing. Sorry this camera doesn't seem to be focusing on my face, but that's okay. Probably for the best. I might have turned the focus off. So happy Friday, friends. Thanks for checking in. It's good to check in with your people during these extended times of isolation. Let people know you're thinking about them. Feels good. And then don't take it personally if they don't get back to you. You know you've done a good thing. Some people are busy, like my nieces. They're very busy. They see my message. They think they know. They think I know that they've seen it. Oh, yeah, cool. Uncle Tommy's thinking about me. That's cool. When it comes to drawing, I don't think very preciously about my artwork. When you go to art school, hopefully you do hundreds if not thousands of uh, drawings, and a lot of them are going to be junk. You throw out a lot of work. So just like that, digital is even cheaper than paper, in a way. Because so each sheet of good quality paper might be, might be a buck, might be five bucks for a really good paper, some arches. 
painting was the most expensive thing I did at art school. I mean, you buy a computer, then you can use it for everything. You could use it for writing your papers, doing video editing, surfing the web, keeping communication. You know, getting a Cintiq like this might be a couple grand, but you have it for a decade. These things last forever. I bought a used one back there, and I, I regret buying the used one. It was cheap. It was like 1200 bucks from a former tattoo artist, but it always had problems. I, I definitely regret that. I probably could have, if I was more motivated, sent it back to Wacom. I started going through the RMA process, but um, I lost communication. Um, it's okay. You know, some things you just got to write off. Some things in life you just can't get too hung up on. Uh, and you can mentally, even if you can't literally write it off on your taxes, at least you maybe can mentally write it off and say that was a lesson. So do I have an actual lesson today? Uh, I don't have one planned. I just wanted to draw this idea out. I thought it would be silly. And it doesn't have to be perfect. I just wanted to kind of get the idea out there like a cartoon. Give you all an update. I'm watching Book of Fett. And it goes between being brilliant and fun and kind of dumb just kind of goes back and forth. Episode 5 was a lot of fun. Glad I signed up for Disney Plus just for that episode 5. Episode 2 was pretty good. But like 1, 3, 4 was like, what's going on, man? I'm not sure if I believe this character. But uh, I, I like that I'm getting a show. And I'm glad to have entertainment than not to have entertainment, you know? It's also hard to go back to the Disney World after being in The Expanse. The Expanse world was really cool. It was pretty metal. Pretty brutal. Pretty realistic. At least it felt kind of realistic. Felt well thought out. And this, on the other hand, is not uh, very realistic at all. Okay, how would you even hold this thing? Probably got a really wide stance. Bracing it against his leg. Very silly idea, but I kind of like it. Very silly. It's okay to do silly stuff every once in a while. You're developing an idea. It's really cool to watch, also on Disney+, Plus, the Peter Jackson Beatles Get Back documentary. Really cool seeing how John, Paul, Ringo, and George worked together in the studio. What their conversation was like, what it looked like. The footage is beautiful. The conversations are interesting. It led me down a path of a lot of Wikipedia articles. Uh, I never listened seriously to the late catalog Beatles work like Abbey Road or the White Album. I loved Sgt. Pepper, but I also loved it as a kid. I didn't listen to it as an adult until recently. And as an adult, uh, in my 30s, my late 30s specifically, I have a much greater appreciation for the arts. When I was younger, I took it for granted. And I had a lot of support to be artistic and to make art. And I thought everyone could just do this and make stuff. And making stuff was normal and common and in demand. And there was a huge industry around supporting and building the arts. But after some serious heartache in my life from my career uh, stalling out in video games, I've come to realize how hard that was, how hard it was to get going, how hard it is to sustain creativity. And um, I often wondered, why did the Beatles only stick together for 10 years? And uh, looking back on my career, my 20s were definitely my most productive. Now, I know more now, but there's something about that raw, youthful energy and that naivety and the creativity and the, you know, 
kind of careless lifestyle where you can just make and make and make and think about like not think about what's up in the future. Look in your twenties, hopefully you're just a rocket taking off for the moon. You don't have the emotional drag that life adds to you as you gain more memories and more experiences you get burned a few times you might get more cautious i think that cautiousness of adulthood uh slows people down at least it does in my case start to fear things that you didn't weren't afraid of i didn't expect that i thought as you get older you get more courageous and i think you're more courageous in some things and uh less courageous in other things so maybe spiders don't scare you as much when you're 38 years old, but saying the wrong thing and losing one of the few friends you have left does. Or it could be the opposite. Maybe when you were young, you were somebody who was afraid of making and losing friends. But then as you got older, maybe you realize, oh, it's not that bad. I can always go somewhere else and make new friends if I'm a nice person get involved with a new thing change the environment change the scene a little bit let's go into drawing the face we got the gun which is going to be the majority part of this drawing let's get into pops mug so we're going to zoom in on our reference and then bring in drawing to be a little closer. I might not have enough resolution. Might be a good time to scale up a little bit. I'm going to think about that. I don't have a lot of resolution. Some certain see pixels here. So it tempts me to go up and scale a little bit. But if I go up in resolution, I'll spend more time drawing than I want to. Because I want it, you know, I want the thing to be viewed here at this distance, not like up super, super close. So if you add, it's very easy if you add too much working resolution you'll spend too much time detailing and you'll forget about the bigger picture that's why i think painters in the studio it's nice to have a big studio too so you can get up walk around have a cigarette have a coffee and look at your painting from 25 feet away that's an important part of the process is to fall back and think about scope where does this detail i'm working on in the corner fit within the overall composition so in the Photoshop world, it's zooming in, zooming out, control plus, control minus, and maybe getting up and walking around too. Sometimes I like to go full screen. What I'll do is I'll do this, I'll image, I'll flip it, and then I'll go walk to the kitchen, get a cup of coffee, get a glass of water, eat a carrot, and then look outside, really refresh my visual nerves and my brain, and then come back to the image and say, okay, what does it look like? All right, well, immediately I can see that some of these lines aren't straight. So maybe I want to adjust a couple things so that the perspective lines are straighter. Like that pops out to me immediately. Everything else is kind of fun. Um, the pose is, is, is pretty fun to me. Maybe I want to um, maybe get his whole body in here. I'm thinking maybe I want to get a little bit more action-y. Maybe something like that. It's kind of fun. Uh, all right. So back to the face. Image for polygonal. What are some interesting, what are the important visual features, the portrait features of Hop here? Well, one, the glasses come up and over. The nose, where does it line up with the ear, the ear pro? So this knob in the ear pro is almost coming across with the glasses level. Let me erase 50% of what we have here and then redraw. Let's go with a tighter brush. Cross, up, over, 
the distal lens will be smaller than the proximal lens. Across, up and over. This is fun. I'm having a good time. I encourage you all to journal and to draw today. Get a little sketchbook, get a little piece of paper. Maybe steal a piece of printer paper and grab a pen, whatever's around, and just doodle something fun. Maybe a stick figure. It's a good time. But then there's a gap between the bottom of the lens and the edge of the nostril. And it comes up. The nostril kind of goes to the bridge of the nose. Nostril comes down. Distal nostril. Noses are very important to get right. A little bump. Hop's lips are very distinct for him. Very thin, very European. And where does that, where does the lip end? It probably ends in the middle of the lens. inside of the sunglass lens. Brandon's chiming in. Brandon Little says, Sir Thomas? The Duke of Dukistan. Brandon Little, ladies and gentlemen. How is the Duke doing today? Sloping forehead. Mossy oak. What do you think about mossy oak? Is it your favorite camouflage? Is it what you rock when you go hunting? Hunting for ducks? Hunting for Dukes. Not many Dukes left in the world, right? Does any country besides England have Dukes? These are important questions. Apparently he's a Duke of York. His name is Breadman. All right, let's get some more specific features. This exterior line of the face is important too. We have a little bit of a bump out for the mouth, and then the indents come back, and then we have the cheekbones. The cheekbones cut underneath the glasses. The glasses extend past the cheekbones, and then there's a hint of something underneath, of the face underneath. Just there's mostly the reflection here, but there is something to do with where the eye is. It's very, um, very much just a hint. Just a hint of an eye there. Clean shaven, Mr. Hop.
Happy Friday, Duke Breadman of Breadmanshire. Collecting his dues from the peasants. The tribute. Over the holidays, watched that Ridley Scott movie, The Duel. Very interesting. Pretty heavy film. Talking about dukes and lords and knights and squires and things. Pretty neat. I believe it was historically real. Based on a real story. All right, that's going to be as close as we get to Portrait of Senor Hop. <laughs> Very Stephen King-esque, but we like it. Okay, let's get some more specific things. What's bothering me about this drawing right now is the arm. I want to resolve this arm here. Arm, elbow, forearm, and then we have a wrist. And I want the wrist to be bent and then grabbing the handle in a kind of, kind of compelling way. So when I when I plan out the hand, it starts with a trapezoid, like a rounded trapezoid shape. It's going to be the knuckles at the tips. Something I'm pretty weak on is understanding the anatomy of the wrist itself. There's a lot of floating bones in there, and the tarsals, metatarsals and stuff. Is that carpals? T carpals, tarsals? Tarsals sound like feet. I think carpals are in the wrist and hand, like carpal tunnel. Let's erase the construction lines. Getting some snow in central Pennsylvania today. Getting a little noivous. I kind of want this, uh, this. This elbow is feeling really low to me. I'm going to lasso select this and rotate it and turn it a bit. It feels a little better. And then get this arm up higher. Something like this. Something, is, something doesn't quite feel right about this body in proportion here. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna flip this canvas and see if I can make any sense out of it. Sometimes I just need a fresh set of eyes. I'm just going to erase and redraw something. Yeah, that's it. You just needed this plaid shirt to kind of come down and around. That's what needed to happen. See, if you get the drawing right, then everything else falls into place. The coloring... And the shading, that's all easy once you get the drawing part right. I illustrate or drawing, one of my drawing teachers in college, Michael Economos, would talk about Ang, spelled I N G E S, Ang, a French uh, famous painter known for painting the portraits of Napoleon and others. Uh, he Spent a long time on the drawing and intentionally elongating stuff to intentionally 
stretching things out, increasing the proportions, making them more heroic. What kind of jeans do you think hot wears? Straight leg, skinny leg, boot cut? Inquiring minds want to know. Let's get the other hand. This hand is too small. The hand proportionally covers the face. So from the nose to the bottom of the chin and from the nose area to the forehead. So I need to increase the size of this hand quite a bit. So one of the beautiful things about digital drawing is that lasso tool and transform. Control T. Got messages. Thank you for messages, my friends. Let's get the other hand. So we have a trigger. I need a reference for what that trigger looks like. And now we could flip it back. Image, image rotation, flip horizontal. F to cycle through, whether it's isolated. I'm not sure what that trigger looks like. It's got a little hingy flap, a little safety built into it. So let's get this thing drawn correctly. Or at least close enough that it's recognizable, you know? And this is just a fun drawing. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just having a good time. And then there's the hingy flap. So now I want I want Hop's hands uh, other hand across this part. So maybe there's a finger and another finger. And a thumb. Maybe the thumb's just poking out there a little bit. Just a silly drawing today. It's extra funny because Hop is so big for him to be suddenly made tiny and have to use his Taurus as an artillery piece. This idea is amusing to me. Amusing. Iterate, 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 refine, refine. I feel like in my drawings lately, I use my eraser more than my pen. I'm making a mess and cleaning it up. That's how I make art. I make a mess and then clean it up. So it's like some kind of takedown pen. Lever, tool, device, doohickey. Doohickey's a great word to use. Let's get the in, the detail of the textured parts of this grip. Because the pattern of the texturing tells a story. It tells the brand. It talks about design, ergonomics. How specific do you need to get as an artist? Well, it's about the commentary. If you're talking about the abstract idea, then you can draw abstractly, which is loosely or approximate. 
The gun could just be a block. But if it's part of the portrait, the portrait is about specificity. What are the choices the artist has made to represent which specific details of the subject? Photographers do this with focus, light, and shadow. By choosing where to focus on is revealing the specificity. For illustrators, it's what lines do you choose to make and omit. For documentary filmmakers, it's what do you leave in and what do you cut? I was watching an interview with Peter Jackson talking about making the Beatles Get Back documentary, and I think he said they had over 18 hours, maybe it was more, maybe it was 40 hours of footage, and they had to decide how to get this down into um, a lighter series. I think it was originally supposed to, they wanted to do a movie, through, let's say a two-hour movie, but there was too much to cut, and he said this would be a crime against the history of rock and roll to cut so much of this. So they ended up settling on a six-hour, three-part miniseries. And I'm glad they did. I actually want to go back and watch the, epi the first episode again. I was a little frustrated watching the first episode. It seemed kind of frustrating and sad. And I didn't know how this show was going to end up. It made me nervous. It made me, it made me sad that there was this great band called The Beatles that made some incredible music, revolutionized pop music, in, like influenced rock and roll. And they weren't getting along. So I just skipped most of the first episode and was like, maybe this gets better. Um, so I went right into the second episode and I was hooked. And then I was thrilled when I saw the results in the third, which the culmination, the performance on the rooftop. Uh, that was cool. So now I want to go back and watch the first episode knowing how it ends. My friend Joe talks about why she likes to watch the same shows over and over again. She calls it her stories. And I was like, why do you watch the same thing over and over again so many times? And it, she said it, it made her comfortable knowing what the ending would be. That things were going to be okay. When I was watching Game of Thrones, I loved the show so much. I was excited for like where it would go and how it would resolve. And then I think universally, season eight was completely panned. It was written without a lot of the guidance of the original writer. Was it George R. R. Martin? I think is the name. And the the ending was so lame. I asked why why HBO did you tell me this story at all? What what's the lesson here? Why did we invest? eight seasons of our time paying attention to this story that ends so dumb. <laughs> we live in an era, I think, where stories are mimicked and the authors don't understand why. Stories and songs in the past were repeated and got, they got popular because they were good, because they were liked. They were shared because people thought they were either satisfying or they had a valuable message. And Jordan Peterson talks about one of his subjects of conversation with Rogan this week was about the Bible being the first book. I mean, you've heard people say, like, I, I, a follower of the book, or they studied the book. It's like the war. The Great War refers to, like, World War I. Like, there are these abstracted terms that represent something very specific. The book, people of the book, the Jews, the Christians, even um, the Islamic world are the peoples of the book versus you know, paganism or Confucius or Taoism, Taoism, Eastern religion type stuff. Uh, that's actually, that's a subject that I didn't really talk about much in the podcast is like Christianity uh, as opposed or people of the book as opposed to people of of the East or of the, the Americas. I mean, I guess they did compare, it, you know, shamanic cultures and they, they did some reference, but shamanic um, ceremonies and cultures versus Christianity, which I thought was really interesting. God, where was I going with that? I got I get tangentially uh, pulled so quickly. I forget what my point was going to be. 
conversations about stories. Oh, yeah, it was the book. It, the, as in, there weren't other stories. So these stories, like, in Peterson's books, too, he talks about the Bible, not that he's a 100% dogmatic follower of it. He is a Christian, but he says, like, this is important to understand because it is the accumulated stories that have been passed down. Like, people across ethnic groups have chosen to retell these stories. And in a time when book authoring didn't exist, there was tremendous effort made to write these, to make paper number one 2,000 years ago, and then to record it, and then to do, go through the book binding, you know, before the time of the printing, pr I mean, the printing press revolutionized the world. But I guess the uh, and thing that he says is there's a, Peterson says his brother-in-law or somebody he knows is a is a chip maker, a micro like a high-level programmer. And that guy said that more revolutionary than the invention of the internet was the invention of the book. The idea of like writing things down on paper and then combining them in a way and then reading them. And, you know, being able to have something to read. And the process of writing stories. A lot of like the the big, big picture concepts of how do you write a story, you know, set word, sentence, paragraph, beginning, middle, end, like all this foundational stuff for how we tell stories today, a big chunk of that foundationally comes from parts of the Bible. Not that you should follow the dogma of it, but the way the story is being told. And of course, the, like the way that story is being told comes from previous Greek things like the Odyssey, right? You know, older stories that were written down and ancient Egyptian stories that were told in hieroglyphics and stuff like that. So, you know, if you like Marvel comics today and superhero stories today and you like Star Wars, like these heroes journey like stories, you, this all comes from a tradition that started with religious writings, right? Without religious writings, then you don't get Marvel. And for the, like, it could be, it could be Viking, it could be pagan stuff, like stories about Thor. And, you know, maybe this is obvious to a lot of people, but uh, I like that the conversation with, you know, Rogan and Peterson talks about the excitement over, like, figuring out the fundamental source of some of these things. I think it's cool. I think it's exciting. Knowing where stuff comes from is really exciting. I mean, it's up to you to choose whether that story is believable or not. I mean, Rogan was talking about, you know, how, you know, how influenced were these stories on psychedelics? That's an interesting subject to him. Because he's a big proponent of psychedelics. I mean, politically, people have a problem with Peterson or Joe. And I think everyone's just too worked up about politics now. When I was growing up in the in Connecticut in the 80s and 90s, you know, politics was something people didn't talk about. You know, you had your politics and you didn't talk about it at the dinner table. Now it's like people lose friendships or relationships over politics. But it seems like if we don't talk about politics, we end up in some kind of existential crisis. Can people get along, politics aside? Uh, when I was growing up, I, my impression was places like France, uh, talking politics was more accepted than places like America. And that might be like, just the political system in France is so different. I mean, where, where did that whole system come from? I and mean, you had hundreds of years of terror and horror, uh, the Jacobins just guillotining people. You had a revolution that killed the monarchy. Same with Russia. Um, and now that led to Russia being a totalitarian state. I think France was a dictatorship under de Gaulle after the war. I don't know what 
I don't know much about 19th century France, like who was in charge. I think it, it flip flopped back and forth between Napoleon, Napoleon's offspring, and then like a king or something. Like it was really, really weird and nasty for a while. Like they had a lot of stabilization to go through before you have like modern democracy France today. And I believe there's more than just two parties in France. I think there's multiple parties and they have some kind of runoff election. Not totally sure about that. We're having a good time. 40 minutes in. Brandon checked in. Thanks, Brandman. Got hop. Hop hugging a big pistol. Let's clean up this G3 thing. Tom, why are you so obsessed with guns? Uh, that's a great question, but I think to not be familiar with guns in a world that has guns is ignorant. I try to teach everybody I know. Any friends of mine, reach out. I will give you a free course on gun safety, how to make a gun safe if you come upon one. I think education is key to safety. You know, this firearms was a Pandora's box that was opened in response to the wars of Europe and the wars of China and the wars throughout all of history. And this box will not be closed. So best to know about it. Same with drugs. I think education is, is key. Knowing what's safe, what isn't safe. Same with behavior, playing sports, football. Football is an incre incredibly physically dangerous sport. But if you're educated on how to tackle people, you can minimize physical risk to yourself. I mean, people were tackling with their head down and causing all kinds of spinal injuries and head concussion injuries there's a way to play tackle sports without causing so much injury look at rugby there's probably still a ton of injuries but i don't imagine it's as traumatic as the average football game i used to like watching football um i've lost some interest now i'll watch the super bowl i'll watch you know i would have liked to have watched some of the playoff games last week but i don't really care about any of the teams I'm excited for the future, though. I'm excited for the future of, uh, of football. I would like to see the Ravens get some kind of good offensive line and some kind of synergy between the incredibly talented Lamar Jackson and uh, the rest of the team. I mean, Ravens football is a fun time if you're in Baltimore. It's one of the good things about Baltimore is that like fan base, the purple camouflage. A 98 Rocks coverage. I love 98 Rock. 98 Rock is an amazing uh, station in some regards. Like back to the whole idea of like how creating art entertainment is really rare and really hard. God, that morning show is so funny. I, every time I'm up early enough to turn it on, maybe if I'm going on a commute into work or I'm driving to a friend's or family's house on a, on a weekday, man, I'm always entertained. Justin Scott and Spiegel. Very entertaining. I wish they... Maybe they do put it on a... I wish there was a way I could listen to it like a podcast where I can tune it on on my own time. More like a Rogan show, long format. Justin's funny. He's a nerd. All right, do I want to shade this? I don't know if I have time for it. kind of like this sketch, just kind of as it is. It's a little goofy, it's a little unfinished, a little raw, but that's okay. It's kind of what I want. Another good thing about digital is you always can come back to it. It's always dry, it's always wet. Just save off a different version if you want to keep working. Back to listening to a different opinions. You know, maybe you don't like Peterson. You don't like the politics of Joe Rogan or something like that. But if you want to actually get into, like, I think if you are a political person and you are just sticking your fingers in your ears and saying la, 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 la to whatever the opponents are saying, how are you going to be prepared for when your proponents actually act? If you don't hear what they say, how are you going to do when they 
when they're actually doing action and stuff. If you're not listening to Russia, the propaganda within the country, what Russia, what Putin's talking about, how are you not going to be anything but flat-footed when those tanks come rolling over the border in Ukraine? So I liked one of the most fascinating, I think, after-action slash post um, mortem discussions about the previous presidency was when Steve Bannon lectured at Oxford Union, or Cambridge Union, one of those English places, and he's booed and panned and people protested. But how else are you going to find out what happened than asking people at the source? Even if you think they're lying the entire time, don't you want to hear what they're saying? To just prepare yourself? Now, I thought it was fascinating. His argument was about, you know, workers felt like they were left in the dust by the modern political parties. You know, Democrats have been saying that they're the workers' party for a long time, yet they're also supporting, uh, you know, the expansion of jobs overseas, like with Clinton. Workers felt left behind. And uh, that's why they there was a mass exodus from the Democratic Party voters to Trump, who was completely untested. It was So this was Bannon's thesis, that it was... People were unsatisfied with what was happening in the standard parties. They wanted something different, just to try. I think that's important to understand, especially in the next election. You know, I think there's like three topics that can get the next president elected that will, uh, could be either side. I think strong military is number one, also because that's a big voting base. Like, whatever side is like, I want a strong military and I want a funded military, you get like 4 million votes right there. Uh, two, jobs programs. And then three is some kind of domestic, um, you know, security. People want to be safe. People want to have jobs. I used to think that, you know, Hillary Clinton could win on a schools platform, but it really fell kind of flat. And I think that's because um, there's a, only a minority of Americans have kids in school at any given time. You might say, like, Tom, what are you talking about? There's a lot of people with kids in school. Yeah, there are a lot of people. But on a percentage-wise, it's a minority. Well, then you can say, like, Tom, well, what about the defense? Like, Why are you – only uh, by that same metric, you know, 4 million people in the DOD, civilians and enlisted or officers – you know, that's a lot less than 360 million. What are you talking about there? Well, a lot of people know somebody who's in the DOD. Like that, for every one person in law enforcement, fired, police, public servants of any kind, you know, 10 to 100 people know that person. And they recognize that's an important job. Firefighters, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, like those are important roles to the safety and security of commerce in, this, in the country. Even if you're a globalist, even if you're a globalist who wants jobs to be all over the world and equity across the entire planet, then you need to have safe trade routes. You've got to have a navy. The greatest contribution the United States has made towards the world is a secure ocean. Where rampant piracy just doesn't happen flagrantly. And I think that's that comes from... <clears throat> The British tradition. I mean, the United States is an offspring of England and the British common law, British naval doctrine. I mean, the United States military is a combination of British naval doctrine and French land doctrine, right? Two of the great continental powers. And then after World War II, we got Blitzkrieg from the Germans. Because the French didn't understand me mechanized warfare very well. The French knew a lot about artillery and people and defenses, though none of it really held up against the Blitzkrieg. So we had to figure that out. We learned about carrier warfare from the Japanese. They figured it out by looking at the British. The British experimented by bombing the Italian Navy. The Japanese saw that and said, okay, we can do that times 10 and we can knock out America before they even get in the war. The Japanese were half right.
and then they grossly underestimated the industrial capability of a pissed off United States. The ability of a nation to raise an army is also incredibly powerful. You know, in World War II, the armies of the world like went up by eightfold. The United States was able to raise eight million men in only a couple of years. That's incredible. It's incredible numbers. Same with Russia, same with Germany. The industrialized powers, because of firearms, the invention of gunpowder and industrial warfare, can raise these incredibly huge land armies in a very short amount of time compared to the ancient world where you had to spend years training professional soldiers in the art of combat, hand-to-hand -hand combat or phalanx warfare like the Greeks invented formations you know you have to have special formations to fight off cavalry attacks meanwhile the factories of russia and the united states during world war ii were able to pump out tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of tanks vehicles machine guns rockets it's specialization of labor and then you could have teenagers running around with missile launchers. As what we see in the Ukraine right now, the United States and Great Britain have ferried explosive ordnance to the frontline fighters on that front. I don't know what to do, though. Like, If you ask me, Tom, what's your opinion about what the West should do in Ukraine? I do not know. My, my heart goes out for him. I think about... A kid I knew growing up who was Ukrainian, Terrence, I think was his name. He was a Ukrainian kid who was, you know, English speaker, raised in the U.S. for the most part. I mean, he might have came over when he was a baby. His parents were refugees. I remember Terrence from elementary school. And you just feel bad for him. It's a country that has been molested by Russia for its entire existence. I don't know, man, but just like Syria, this is clearly Russia's turf. I mean, we would, how would the United States feel if the Russians were sending weapons to Mexico right now? How would we feel about that? We wouldn't let it happen. We'd create a barricade. It would be like Cuban Missile Crisis all over again. We'd stop those ships in transit. There was some hub hubaloo last year or the year before about Russia sending support, military support to Venezuela because we were talking about an intervention down there. Sending troops or supplies to aid the revolutionaries who weren't, di weren't digging the Maduro regime. If you watch that show Chernobyl on HBO, you can't help but feel bad for the Ukrainians. Cannon fodder, man. Cold War nuclear reactor fodder. And most of that whole area of the world is just a giant rust bucket. At least that's what I'm perceiving from the content I see from such YouTubers as Shai who are exploring the industrial wasteland. I mean, you might argue that that's the, that's the case in the United States, too. Just this morning, a bridge collapsed in Pittsburgh, a bridge that was known to be dangerous for at least three years. 2018, there was pictures of rusted-out cross beams, supports. How is there such negligence? Maybe you can go to Detroit. I wonder what the heck happened. This used to be a great city with tons of wealth and manufacturing. I don't know what that twist weight in that barrel is, but it's got some rifling. I think this is pretty cool for now. I'm 54 minutes in. I had a good time doodling this thing.
up. By Tom Simons, 128, 22. <laughs> so I'm feeling pretty good about this. This is a goofy drawing by Tom on a Friday. I hope you all have a great weekend. Stay warm. Be careful on the roads out there. I think we're getting snow. This weekend on the East Coast, stay bundled up, man. Peace out.